Welcome to uh, the first of our ISTS uh, computer science series of lectures on the human factor in computer security. Uh, it's my pleasure today to host Harold Thimbleby from the University of Swansea in Wales, who is a renowned world expert in health IT and has some really great videos if you check them out. Uh, but uh, his, uh, some of his accolades include winning the uh, 2014 GE Healthcare Award for Outstanding Impact in Healthcare. And as a security person, I have to ask, what was the direction of the impact? Yes, this is, there you go. Oh, there's there we go. There's the outstanding <laughs> impact right there. Um, <laughs> been a Royal Society Wilson Research Merit Award holder, a Lever Hume Trust Fellow, uh, expert on, uh, advisor on IT, the Royal College of Physicians, uh, and we're very glad to have him here to talk about health IT and computer issues. Oh, Carol. thank you. I've just noticed there's a camera at the back that probably doesn't like me moving around too much, but uh, there's no point you coming to this because you could watch something on YouTube, but in YouTube you can't interact with me at all. So can you tell me a bit about who you are? Uh, who here is, is clinical? Anybody clinical? Yay, welcome. Uh, what about computer scientists? A lot of you computer scientists. Uh, are any of you patients? Yeah, so all, all of you probably, or you have been when you were a baby. Uh, any groups I've missed out? Uh, yeah, what are you? Healthcare IT. Healthcare IT, yeah. Any other healthcare IT people? Yeah, good. So please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'm you know, very happy to deal with questions as, as they crop up. And if you don't interrupt me, you're just going to get a sort of what would happen even if you weren't here. So ha having it interactive, having people ask me questions, you know, that's why I'm here rather than you sort of Skyping to me back in Britain. Uh, I've got this little movie, uh, two cars crashing that were built 50 years apart. And you can see that the old car comes out very badly. In fact, the driver of the old car comes out very badly and would almost certainly, uh, is it this picture? There's, there's, there's the old Chevy uh, and it's about to crash. It's an offset collision with the new Chevy. There it goes. And the dummy representing you as the driver of the old car, uh, definitely not going to survive that. And if you look closely, the, even the windscreen on the new Chevy isn't even broken. Uh, the driver of the new car will probably have a bit of earache because the airbags went off, but basically they're going to be able to walk away from it. So in 50 years, that transformation has happened to cars. And uh, I'm going to convince you that that transformation hasn't happened in healthcare. And I want to try and tell you ways in which it might happen. So this is a very good way of starting. And in fact, I'm going to finish with cars again because there's a lot to learn from how cars have improved. So how did this happen? If you think back to the 1950s, when that old Chevy was around, we would have thought that was a terrific car, right? Whereas now, it's idiotic to think that that is a terrific car, because you can see you know, these sharp edges on it, a hard thing at the front, it didn't have seat belts, didn't have ABS. This is a crap car that you would not buy now. It's very hard to get yourself into the mentality where you thought that that was wonderful, but that's how we were. 50, 60 years ago. What happened to get modern cars like this? This is a Skoda Fabia. Uh, I've, I used to have one like this, but it's, this is a modern car. You can see that that is a modern car, and this is an old nasty one. It's, sort of kind of, it's, it's obvious. How did that obviousness happen? Uh, I think it comes down to Ralph Nader, 1965. He published a book, Unsafe at Any Speed, and he drew people's attention to the nasty market the manufacturers of cars then were saying, drivers have accidents. It's not our fault. It's like saying, nurses kill patients. Nothing to do with me. So we moved on to new cars like that. Um, that's my car, and this is my car. Um, I lent it to my son, Isaac, just before he got married. The day before, he needed to nip over to see his fiance. And uh, you know what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> It's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, Isaac had an accident. Just talking about it makes it sound like it was his fault. Right? Isaac had an accident. That's what we say. 
but actually he was in the car when it was hit by another car and the driver of the other car, Fred, say, Fred would say, I had an accident. So whose fault was it? In fact, the police say at that road junction, there's an accident every week. It is the junction that had the accident. The idiot who built the junction caused the accident, not Isaac, nor the other driver. Both cars were write-offs. Um, this car was a write-off. It's a funny concept, what a write-off means, but it basically means it costs more to repair it than it does to give me a few thousand pounds. Um, the red mark on the windscreen, uh, something interesting. That's not his head. That is the red explosive from the airbag. But that was an offset collision, which coincidentally was just like the Chevy collisions I'd shown you. The three people would have died if they had been driving 50-year-old cars. All of those three people got out of those cars uninjured, right? Shit happens, accident happens, but there's a huge difference between an accident and the harm that could follow from it. And what's happened here is the manufacturers know that shit happens and they have designed their cars with airbags, ABS and sensors and stuff like that. The technology turns, stops an accident being a catastrophe, right? And just to rub this in, here's a horrific photograph I'll show you, just so you can skip it if you like, and fortunately it's in black and white. This is what this accident would have looked like 50 years earlier, right? It would have been shit. Because no seat belts, no airbags, no impact absorption, stuff like that. So, the best way to improve healthcare is to improve computers. That's my argument. The best way to make cars safer is not to train drivers more. They're already good enough. The best way to make cars safer is to improve the technology in cars. Uh, here's, here's, of course, Homer, and he's a good way of introducing an idea. We've got big eyes and we've got tiny minds, and that's true of all of us. And uh, I don't know whether you come across Daniel Kahneman, thinking fast and thinking slow, but uh, this uh, is a book I highly recommend. He's won the Nobel Prize for this work, so it's, I'm going to describe it and you're going to think that it's kind of obvious, but it's, it was insightful. Homer illustrates your eyes and your little cognitive consciousness inside. And uh, Kahneman represents it like this. We've got system one, which is our perception, and our conscious thinking is system two. And there are several th points he makes. Our conscious thinking is hard work, and we don't like doing it, and it's slow and tedious, and I'd rather not do it, actually. And our system one is our perceptual system, hearing, sight, stuff like that. And it is easy, it is fluent, it happens without any conscious intervention very fast, so that's thinking fast, thinking slow. And this diagram makes it very clear that your consciousness, your train of thought, knows nothing about the world except for what the perceptual system has told it. I think that's really important. So you think you're thinking clearly about the world, but if your perceptual system has misled you for any reason, you have no idea. And then, of course, there's the world outside that, and there's this boundary, and we can carry on like that. It's handy to remember these System 1 and System 2 by calling them Homer and Spock, because that's roughly what they're like. Now, I'm going to rub this into you by giving you a little quiz. Some of you may be familiar with this quiz, in which case you can just sort of play along. What I want you to do when I show you this sentence is I, I want you to read it, and then I'm going to ask you how many letter Fs there are. Okay, so read the sentence and then count how many F's there are in the sentence. Everybody happy? You can all count up to ten, right? So this is, this is an easy job. <laughs> so, how many people think there's more than one F? Okay, yeah, you're all happy there's more than one F. More than two? Keep your hand up. More than three? More than four? More than five? Well, some of you put your hands down. More than six? More than seven? Interesting, isn't it? You, you're all adults, you're all Dartmouth people. You can all count. It is not hard to count, but you are disagreeing on how many Fs there are. An F in each line. Hmm? An F in each line. I can't hear An F in each line. An F in, so how many Fs are there? Uh, five lines. Five Fs? Yep. 
Okay, I'm now going to use some tech. I'm now going to use some technology to show you where the Fs are. So, this was not a prepared thing. So, what is very interesting is counting Fs is a hard piece of work, and your system to your conscious thinking. Yes. I'll try and delegate it to system one, where life is easy. And you tell your perceptual system, find me Fs. And your perceptual system says F, 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 and your cognitive system counts one, two, three, and it's easy. And Sergio here, his perceptual system let him down because the F there, he pronounces V. It's an OV, right? So his perceptual system missed it. Does that make sense? So he can count, I'm pretty certain he can count, but his perceptual system was looking for f, and it missed a v, and he had no idea he had missed it. So, I mean, there's six f's. That's what it is like. Now, this idea that you use your perceptual system because it's fluent and easy and so on is called attribute substitution. Here's an example of it. Uh, I, my cognitive system, wants me to lose weight. It's actually hard work to lose weight. And when I see something that looks nice, my perceptual system says, that's nice, it's good for you, <laughs> right? This is how it works, right? And I have no idea, and then I'm sort of eating it, and then I realize, well, I didn't mean to do that. You just get led astray, and you don't realize you're being led astray. Attribute substitution happens without you knowing it. So, it is a bit of text. Attribute substitution, system two, the Spock, has no idea it is happening. And we need technology to help us think more clearly. So let me give you an example of how this is messing up healthcare. Here is a nasty pile of patient notes, which I photographed. Let's go paperless. Obvious, right? And here's a cute person using an iPad, right? This is the future, it is wonderful. Actually, going paperless is a lot more complicated than that and your cognitive system can't begin to think about the problems of going paperless. It's much easier to think, it's cute, therefore it is right, which is attribute substitution. Because once your perceptual system has decided iPads are wonderful and I want one, right? I want an iPad Air or something, you know, it'll solve all my problems, well then why do I need to think about it? And this happens all the time. It happens with us making decisions when we buy technology, and it is also happening to the designers who build the stuff. They are not thinking clearly enough. They need help to design better technology. So my talk's message is error doesn't matter. You know, shit happens. What you want to do is stop the shit turning into harm. Right? My kid has a car accident. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, uh, lost some money, but nobody got hurt. You want the technology to be improved to stop the accidents turning into catastrophe. When harm occurs, everything has gone wrong. It's very easy for the world to say, when harm has happened, the nurse made a mistake. Well, actually, the technology made a mistake, the training made a mistake, the hospital made a mistake. Uh, you killed somebody with an overdose, well, the drug manufacturers made a mistake. Why does that drug not have an antidote? All sorts of things. Everything has gone wrong. Just blaming the nurse, which is a common thing, is so easy to do, we latch onto it and stop thinking. And you can improve things, certainly, with conventional human factors. Train nurses more about human factors, you know, teamwork, resilience, and stuff like that. But I think you end up then blaming the nurse who kills somebody by saying, well, you hadn't done your human factors course recently. You know, it becomes a, a meta problem. Instead, if you improve the technology, everything gets better without anybody needing to know anything. So I'm going to pick up on this in this talk. You can improve things with better computer science. And in order to convince you of that, I want to convince you that the current stuff is crap computer science. And I put computer science in inverted commas there because in one sense, computer science is wonderful. It's actually the practice of computer science that is crap. Uh, the programmers out there don't know how to program. But the fact that there are people who can program, is a, you know, there's a different issue. That's why I've put it in inverted commas. We need more effective design methods because the programmers out there can't cope with the complexity of these things, even though they're actually really quite simple things like 
who here knows how to use formal methods? That's hard work. We need tools to do formal methods to help us reason more carefully. This slow system two stuff is too hard. And you think the program's cute or programming in Java, so it must be better than using C++. Another approach is using stochastic methods. Well, if you can't do analysis, simulate stuff, simulate users and try it out. I'll give you some examples of these things later. And we need to have pressure somehow to improve. Nobody's going to bother to improve the quality of stuff unless there's an economic reason to do so. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to come back to how we create that reason once I've convinced you that stuff is crap. So I've told you about one son of mine, Isaac. Uh, this is Sam. You can tell which is Sam. And he married a lovely Chinese, Chinese girl. And uh, in Hong Kong, where he got married, I started thinking, how much of the world is Chinese? And if you look it up on Wikipedia last week, there were billion, 1.3 billion Chinese people, uh, probably more now. And the world has got 6.8 billion. So what fraction of the world is Chinese, right? This is really easy. This is easier than a drug dose calculation. Okay. So if you're a nurse giving somebody morphine, you've got to do a calculation, how many milligrams per hour out of this concentration and so on. This is a really easy calculation. Let's do it. And I'll do it on the Casio <laughs> HS8V, which happens to be Britain's most popular calculator. And this is how you do it. First of all, you have to clear the calculator, because if you don't clear it, you know, stuff will go wrong. And then you type in the numbers and do the division. And you have to press equals, and you get the answer. About a fifth of the world is Chinese. Yeah, no problems. Everybody happy? Oh, well, I've come to America. How much of the world is American? So you've got 307 million odd people in here. Let's do exactly the same thing with the same calculator. So you clear it, press in the numbers, and you get the answer. About 45% of the world is American. OK, what's gone wrong? This is what actually happens. Yeah, it's out by a factor of 10 because the world population is a digit too long. And I misled you because the Chinese population is also a digit too long. So if the Chinese population and the world population are both out by a factor of 10, the ratio is correct. Okay. But here we have got an error the calculator knew about, and Casio couldn't be bothered to tell us it was out by a factor of 10. Right? The calculator, if it could have it had been programmed properly, it would have said, you are fucked if you're doing this. <laughs> but they couldn't be bothered to tell you. It is your fault that you've made a mistake. It's more interesting if you do it on an iPhone. If you do it that way, you get the wrong answer. And if you do it that way, you get the right answer. <laughs> OK. Now, I don't know. My eldest son works for Apple, but so um, I don't know who programmed this, but when I was at primary school, do you call it primary school over here? You know, when, I, when I was so high, I was taught when I did sums to do them two different ways. And if you get different answers, you're wrong. You may not know which one's wrong, but if you get two different answers when you do a sum, you're wrong. Do it again. The iPhone has code in it that can take your sum and get two different answers. So it knows it is wrong. And Apple can't be bothered to tell you it is wrong. Right? Here is a Cardinal Health infusion pump I was playing with at Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, they've got little modules on them, so you can clip on. Here's a syringe driver, and you can clip on other things and have lots of modules. And this is module A. Oh, oh, can you see it says the rate is 9 mils per hour? And then underneath it, it says it's 9 milligrams per hour. Oh, which is it? Right? The designers have completely lost track of what they're doing. So this is module A. And if you look at it from a different angle, it's module 9. If you look at it from a different angle, it's module H, module 4. Right? <laughs> this is crap. Yeah? It is going to cause problems. And uh, here, uh, while I was playing with it, can you see? Minus 0.1 is less than minimum rate. So this is a syringe driver that is designed to give people a drug. It is sucking out here. This is a bug. Uh, here's a B-Brawn infusion pump. 
Uh, it's the thing about this size. And the way you enter a number on this is you use the arrow keys. You can see four arrow keys there. And you can move the cursor currently on zero to move left and right. And then you can use the up and down keys to increase or decrease the digit. Okay. And I put the version 686E because different versions work in different ways, which is bonkers. Uh, v to be I stands for volume to be infused. And just for fun, I'm going to enter a very... Uh, I could show you lots of bugs with this, but I'm going to show you a simple bug that is easy to explain. Some of them are rather complicated to explain. Uh, I'm going to enter a hundredth of a milliliter as the volume to be infused, which might be good for an epidural. Uh, so I move right, and I move right, and I'm going to increase, okay, to enter one hundredth of a mil. And this is what happens on the B. Braun infuser mat. Oh, that's interesting. I just got a capture error here. I pressed the up arrow rather than... Um, so here we go. I press the up arrow. And I've shown it to people in B-Brawn, and they say, well, that's what it does. <laughs> <laughs> Which, but it is now set for the VTBI to be 10 times higher than you intended, and it has not warned you. Right? And if you're like a pediatrician and you've got a baby here and you're pressing things like this, you're screwed because it is not telling you. You told it to do something. It is not doing it. There is an error it could have detected, but the programmers can't be bothered to tell you, just like all the other stuff I've shown you. you know, it needs an airbag to go off in your face to say you're all right. We're not going to do this infusion because you wanted to turn right onto the road. You've been hit by somebody else and, boom, you should stop. But this isn't doing that. Right? And if this led to an adverse incident, it would be the nurse's fault because the log from this device will say 0.1. It won't say what the nurse told it to do because the user interface is screwed up. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm using words like crap and fucked, but that's, that's the truth of it. This is crap programming, and it fucks up people's lives. It kills people, and it ruins clinicians' lives. Second victim. You know, the first victim is the patient who gets killed, and the second victim are all the professionals around it whose lives are ruined by the incident. This is a disaster, and the world is set up so that nothing is sorting this out. Because if this has been passed by the FDA, there's nothing wrong with it. So it must be the nurse's fault. And you teach computer science, this is the Bible. Uh, 1,292 pages, beautifully written introduction to the design of algorithms, the Bible of the field, the best textbook ever seen. These are things that are on the back page. It's the third edition, so it can't be that bad. It, they're still in business. Right. Do you know what it says in chapter one? We do not address error handling. Right. So we teach our kids to program, and we don't teach them how to handle errors because it's too complicated. Um, here's a Casio calculator. Uh, I'm going to do something really simple. Normally you use a calculator to do a complicated calculation and, uh, uh, and you don't know what the answer is. I'm going to do something so easy you know what the answer is. So this is going to seem a bit odd. But in reality, you do a calculation and you wouldn't know if you got the wrong answer. Because if you knew you, what the wrong answer was, you wouldn't bother using a calculator. You'd just work it out, right? So I'm going to enter 1.75. That's all I'm going to do. This calculator has got a delete key on it, so I'm going to make an error. The delete key is to help you recover from an error. So I'm going to make a slip, and I'm going to recover from it by pressing the delete key. I'm going to enter one point, point, whoops, delete key. Happens to be a right arrow for some reason, and press 7.5. Okay? Happy? I've entered 1.75. Delete keys delete the previous character. Yeah? You've used Microsoft Word. Even Microsoft Word, that's how it works, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not how this thing works. Uh, because you'll end up with 75. The delete key, well, the right terminology is it's fucked. It ignores the decimal point, so it deletes the previous digit. So one point point delete ends up with zero, and then 0 0.75 it ends up with 0.75. So imagine what happens. Here's, here's a nurse who posed for me, and the policeman goes up to her and says, you killed a patient, you gave them 75 mils of morphine or whatever. Yeah, overdose. What's the nurse going to say? If they're going to say something like, well, I thought I'd entered 1.75, but you're holding the piece of paper. I just don't understand it. I guess I made a mistake. 
and she's just incriminated herself because Cassio got it wrong. Uh, I didn't bring the Casio calculator with me. I brought the Hewitt Packard Easy Calc 100, and it works in exactly the same way. Um, you can play with it if you don't believe me. So, worst outcome going upwards, worse care to the left, better care to the right, and we'll expect to get a line something like that. As you get better care, then you get better outcomes. And I'm belaboring this because accidentally I'm going to reverse the axes a bit later, but never mind. Um, so I've done some simulations with this calculator, which is why you get a wiggly line. Along the bottom, I've got the probability that the nurse is noticing they're making an error. So if they notice they make an error, they press the delete key to recover from it. And vertically, I've got the probability that they've ended up entering a number that's more than a factor of 10 out. Okay? So the more, the worse you are going upwards, I'm getting my grammar right. As you go upwards, you've got the probability of getting more than out by 10 in the dose you're entering into this calculation. Across the bottom, you've got the probability you notice an error. So the better the nurse is, 80% of the time, when they make a mistake and they notice they make a mistake, they have a very low probability of an out by 10 error. But if they don't notice they're making a mistake, they, they've got quite a high probability of making out by 10 errors. And the wiggly line is, this is from maybe a million simulations of people typing, because it's got a model of how people type, so you can type numbers accurately. That is how Hewitt-Packard work, this thing, which you can play with. Just like, and it works in exactly the same way as the Casio. It's got a broken delete key. If you fix the delete key, you end up with the green line, which is a bit lower. In other words, programming this correctly, you end up with a safer calculator. The Institute of Safe Self-Medication Practices recommends how you should enter drug doses. And if you imply that syntax, you end up even safer. For instance, the Institute of Self-Medication Practices says you shouldn't have two decimal points in a number, which is we all knew that, but Hewitt Packard and Casio don't know that, and they let you enter numbers with multiple decimal points, and they go wrong if you enter multiple decimal points. So if you fix that, you end up with something safer. That makes sense? It's sort of the, the Institute of Self Medication Practices is an organization that makes recommendations, and I have found no medical device that has listened to the ISMP. And this shows if you do, you end up with a big improvement. So let's take, and I'll show you in a moment, a typical nurse hovers around 10%. And you might think, gosh, that's a high number. Surely nurses are better than that. Well, that's thanks to Daniel Kahneman System 1 and System 2. You have no idea how often you're making errors. I mean, if you knew, you wouldn't make the errors. Right? So, and it turns out in our labs, nurses, unstressed, without screaming patients in front of them, hover around there. So if you go up to the Hewitt-Packard thing, 2% of the numbers you enter, without you knowing it, are going to be out by more than a factor of 10. If you improve the technology, the same nurse would be doing better. And if you look at it this way, it's as if you have improved the quality of the nurse to about 0.4, okay? which is about four times better, just by improving the technology. And you don't have to tell the nurse anything. So looking at that another way, typical nurse is effectively made four times safer just by listening to what ISMP say and implementing it correctly. Now I've swapped the graph around. I've got worse care on the left, better care on the right, and a better outcome going upwards. So this is different from the last graph. And you end up with a graph that looks like this. Along the bottom now, I've got the probability that the nurse notices an error. So the further this way, the better they are. And the lower, uh, sorry, the, the lower this line is, the worse it is, and the higher it is, the better. And uh, I've called this, there, there is the point 0.1, and they're about three times better. I've called this the Thimbleby effect. Um, I gave a talk with Kevin Fu, and uh, I was saying, I think this is such a good idea, it ought to have a name. And he said, well, call it the Fu effect. But uh, <laughs> I've called it the Thimbleby effect. What is the Thimbleby effect? It is. Computers can be enormously improved, right? There's a huge range in that graph, right? But the improvement benefits worse situations more than good situations. If the nurse is perfect, improving the technology is not going to make much difference. But in fact, nurses are under stress for all sorts of reasons. 
The more stress they're under, the more improving the technology will help them. If you're like with my kid Isaac driving a car, the worse a driver he is, the more he's going to rely on the airbags. So that's the Thimbleby effect, as it were. Improving technology is better than improving staff, because if you want to set out to improve staff, you've got a massive training problem, and staff are distracted, they're overworked, they're stressed, all sorts of things. If you improve the technology, everything is improved automatically. Okay, where do these numbers come from? Uh, Patrick Elegeme, uh, one of my PhD students, has done some research uh, using eye tracking. Which of these user interfaces is safer? So what we found is unnoticed errors, and this is what's interesting, if you notice an error, you're going to correct it, so that's not very exciting. Unnoticed errors, the nurse enters a number and they don't know they have made a mistake. They run at about 3.5% with the Arabic numeric keypad. With the up-down keypad, it's twice as good. Why is that? Any ideas? Your choices? Yeah, I think oh. there's two more buttons over there. Yeah? A few choices. You're almost there. Uh, we did some eye tracking. This is my eye, by the way. Um, when you've got lots of button, you spend a lot of time looking at the keys to know which one to press, and you rarely look at the display. When you've got a few buttons, you don't need to look at the buttons to know which one to press and you look at the display a lot. So here, you notice when you make a mistake more often. So eye tracking is really interesting. You have no idea where you're looking, which is why you do an eye tracking experiment to find out where people are looking. And it turns out that you spend your time looking at the keypad, not at the display. So if something goes wrong with pressing the keys, you do not notice it, typically. Very rarely do you look at the display because you're distracted looking at the key. And you do not know this. So, uh, here's a calculation, which is, was it going to be 16, and I'm going to enter it like that, and I'm going to use my Apple iPhone, and I'll show you what Apple do, because they don't know about this piece of research. So here, here's the Apple iPhone, and I'm going to enter that sequence of keystrokes, press C, press 1, divide by 0, point, and I'm going to make a slip now. Now remember, you're going to be staring at the keypad, not at the display. So I press plus, Apple have said error, and I carry on, plus three times two equals, and the answer is six. Can you see what's happened? Because Apple don't know about that for research, they think they have told you there's been an error, but you do the calculation and you glance up and the answer is six. You made a mistake you didn't know about. If you knew about the mistake, you wouldn't have made it. You've made a mistake you don't know about. You look up and you write down six. If you do this calculation on a Casio calculator, once the error happens, it locks up and it will say E until you press clear. You have to acknowledge an error has happened. But on this Apple, it sort of says, error, and you miss it, and you carry on. Uh, here's a medical app. Uh, Mersey Burns has run lots of prizes, and it's, uh, it's a good state-of-the-art application. And what you do, a uh, patient turns up, they've got burns on their face, and you start drawing on it, and uh, let's colour them in like this. Um, badly burnt. And you can press a button to find out what dose of fluid, because when you're burnt, you need to give people fluid to help them. And this says, give them three and a bit litres in the first eight hours. Well, if we press this button here, we can turn the body over and maybe patient's got burns on the back. So let's uh, give them 14% burns on the back. And we then click how much fluid should we give the patient. And it said no fluid should be given. What's, what's happened? We've uh, painted this side of the body, turned it over, and then entered a number. It turns out that when you enter a number, the programmer thought you either want to draw it or enter a number. So if you enter a number, we'll clear all the drawing you've done. But because I mischievously turned it over, you can't see that it, all the burn area has disappeared. So you've got the wrong answer. 
So you've got an error you cannot see. This is going to cause problems eventually. Here's another thing. Uh, this looks like nine kilograms down there. That's the weight of the patient. And uh, we ask for you know, how much fluid should we give, give them. But the weight of the patient here is 10 to the 88 kilograms. Yeah. The user interface is screwed up, yeah, obviously. And uh, do you know how big 10 to the 88 is? <laughs> well, the square root of 10 to the 88 is the weight of the Milky Way. <laughs> and I, I've corresponded with the programmer, and he said, but if that was the weight, then that would be the... <laughs> <laughs> So how Mersey Burns is tested is, is available in that. And when you launch this application, it runs some tests to check that the formula it's using is being correctly implemented by the iPad or whatever you're running it on. They didn't check the user interface. They checked the formula. So the testing wasn't looking for errors. And uh, some of the computer scientists will know about invariants. What they've done is they've looked at the Parkland formula, which is this, which works out what volume of fluid you need. It's a bit more complicated than that, but basically that's what they did. And when you switch on the program, it runs 20,000 tests on that. But what they should be doing is to say, is there a possible way of making an error in the user interface, like entering a ridiculous number? Uh, and in fact, when you think about it, the error should be if the area of the patient is less than zero or bigger than 100% or the mass of the patient is less than zero. There's a long list of error possibilities they didn't think about in the invariant checking they're doing. And because of that, they have, you know, or another problem I didn't mention is when you switch it on, it assumes a 60 kilogram patient. So actually, the patient is unknown. So there are lots more possibilities they didn't think about, and yet they think they're testing it. Uh, to put it bluntly, um, they're not very good programmers. Or, or to put it, put it a bit more fairly, their programming isn't good enough for a safety-critical task like a Burns resuscitation application. You know, uh, they can program really well, and they've got something really cute, and it's won prizes. The world thinks this is a good program, but it has got flaws in it that people cannot see. So I've told you uh, there are all these problems. And you might think, well, you know, who cares if you give somebody 0.1 of a mil when it should have been 0.01? Does it matter? And I'm going to say, yes, it does. The best data I've got is from a paper published in uh, December two years ago by a chap called James, who estimated how many deaths are caused by preventable error. So. Some deaths are caused in hospitals by errors, like I give you a drug you're allergic to, but I didn't know that, that's an error, but it's not preventable. But if I knew you were allergic to penicillin and I still give it you, that's a preventable error. So these there, heart disease kills about 26% of us, cancer kills about 23% of us, and he estimates 18% of us are killed by preventable errors in hospitals. And I think that is an underestimate, because if you go into hospital and you've got cancer, and you're given an overdose of morphine, which could easily happen, the doctor's not going to say, I gave you an overdose of morphine and killed you. They're going to say you died of cancer. So I think this is an underestimate. But preventable error is the third biggest killer. James's paper estimates that harm is a factor of 20 higher than that. So people come out with... Uh, I mean, one, one of the examples I've come across recently is uh, people having an accident on their arms, they end up with paralyzed arms. That's not death, that's harm. And then there's the second victim, Kimberly Hyatt, uh, is a pediatrician in Seattle, and she gave a baby an overdose of calcium chloride. And this is what happened. It's a horrific story. Um, she made the error. Ah, uh, shit, I made, oh, I don't know what she said, but shit, I made an error. And she reported it, which is the right thing to do. She was escorted from the hospital and put on administrative leave, which I think is not the right thing to do. And then the nursing commission gave her a $3,000 fine, 80 hours of new coursework, and four years on probation. 
And she's now probably the safest paediatrician in the hospital. And yet she's being treated like a, like a witch. This is one of the problems. Uh, you expect nurses to be angels and then they kill somebody. So they're obviously witches. And then there's a whole media hunt on them and it's horrific. And it, the story gets worse because the next thing that happens is Kimberly Hyatt commits suicide. And the story gets worse because the nursing commission then didn't follow up what happened and we don't know. Was she using a Hewitt Packard calculator or a Casio HS8V? We have no idea and I've written to the hospital and they don't reply but it matters because if they were using a HS8V there are ways in which this could have happened which would have been Casio's fault but I mean I don't know. It might have been the pharmacy had got the wrong dose in the, you know, there are all sorts of ways it could have happened. But the assumption is if the nurse committed suicide, well, she's as good as admitted it was her fault. So the, the death rate from preventable error is horrific. And the consequences of that is horrific on the medical profession as well. And a large part of this, we don't know how much of it, is caused by crap. IT, crap embedded computer systems. So what can we do? Well, when you're a hospital procurement, you ought to be buying safer stuff. And that would then put economic pressure on the people who are producing worse stuff. So here are two uh, little infusion pumps, which I photographed. Here is a bodyguard 545. And here is a bodyguard 545. Which one are you going to buy? You're going to buy the cute colored one because it, your system one, your Homer, says it's cute, it must be better. And what you're going to do is end up with a hospital that's got both of these things in it, and they work in a different way, and you're going to, technical term is, they're going to induce errors. They're going to induce transfer errors, because if a nurse can use that one on the left, they can't use the one on the right. On the left, you've got two increases, zero decreases. On the right, you've got five increases, zero decreases, and you know, it's just mad. But the company thinks if it looks a bit like an iPad, it must be better, right? This is system one thinking. It's attribute substitution. It looks colorful and high resolution, you know, but they haven't thought it through in enough detail. OK, so how are we going to improve this? Uh, I've got a Land Rover, and uh, every so often I have to buy new tires for it, as you do. And this tire looks like a good tire, right? And you can see that is a good tyre, and you can see this is one I photographed in India, actually. The, this is a tyre that's probably not very good. So when you see these, your perceptual system can see that this is better than that one, and it's a no-brainer to choose which is which, right? But when you go to the garage, and in Britain it's quick fit, these are the people who sell you tyres, uh, they end up showing you a bunch of tyres. Now, which one are you going to buy for your car? Well, Homer is stuffed, because they look the same. So I'll just remind you which one I bought. And the European Union has realized that this happens to everybody who goes and buy cars tires. You have no idea which tire to buy. And actually, the best way of coming out alive from an accident is not to have the accident in the first place. The tires are the most it's arguable. The tires and the brakes are the most important safety feature of your car. If you buy good tires, you're less likely to hit somebody. So how do you choose which tire to buy? Well, what happens is QuickFit tell you Bridgestone, Pirelli, and Continental. I don't know. And then they tell you the price. And then I say, well, because I've got a Land Rover's permanent four-wheel drive. I want to buy a five, five wheels all at once. You don't want wheels of different diameter. So he says, well, if you buy five, I can give you 75 quid a tire for that. Well, I'm going to buy the Continental, thanks, which is what I did. And two months after I did that, the law changes. And now tires have to have a label on them, which you can see. And the label tells you the fuel efficiency, the stopping distance in the wet and the noise, I bought the tyre that was worst on all three factors because I couldn't see how good it was. It was too hard a job to figure it out, so Homer gave, uh, Spock gave up, gave over to Homer, and Homer was persuaded by the lovely financial deal, 75 quid for a tyre. The EU realises this, and they are now making 
these important factors visible to consumers so that you can see which one is better. And they've done the same thing with white goods. If you buy a fridge, it'll have a label on it that rates the energy efficiency because we want to have more energy efficient devices. But you can't tell you know, Bosch or Philips which is more efficient. So you put this label on it and Homer can tell the difference. So you now buy fridges that are more energy efficient. You know, if you can't tell between them, well, let's get the A-rated one. And in fact, with fridges in Britain, the energy rating now goes A star, A star, star, A star, 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 A star, 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 because the manufacturers realized they could get to A star A very easily. And, and the EU said, well, let's improve the rating. What's really nice about this is the EU has not had to tell manufacturers how to become better. They have just said, let the consumer know which is better and then the consumer will buy the better thing, and then the market forces will encourage the manufacturers to make better things. So, yeah. yeah. This uh, thing called the Blue Heart Law, mm -hmm. um, comes out of Britain, um, that once you, set, once you use a metric as a goal, it tends to lose its usefulness. Right. So, that's, that's a good, good thing, if we go back to this. Uh, I said a moment ago that the EU has changed this for fridges and you've got A star, 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 and star. These things change all the time because once the manufacturers get the noise rating right, these will change so that they start thinking about lifetime of the tyre. When you throw it away at the end of its life, a tyre that lasts longer would be a good idea. But at the moment, these are the most important things. So this is a dynamic approach to the market. How do you measure these things? Well, uh, I'm starting to run out of time. Um, here, here's a, a Baxter colleague three, which is a, a nasty piece of work. But uh, we have built uh, a device we've called PVS IO Web. It uses PDS, which is a theorem improving environment that Stanford came up with. And we've, we can simulate it within it, and we can find bugs in the source code of the programs. And the FDA has started to trial this for pre market surveillance. The result of doing this is we can give a quantified list of problems with the design of devices so that you could put labels on them like like that <laughs> but this sort of approach means that these labels that i showed you for car tires could be put onto medical devices if people wanted to do that right that's an important point if we want to make healthcare it medical devices safer we can start to do it so i've very nearly finished uh, I thought I'd show you this picture. A couple of years ago, there was a horrific accident in Spain when a train going very fast came off and killed 78 people. Did you hear about this? July 2013, I think. And uh, Peter Shepard, who's the chair of uh, the Institute of Engineering and Technologies Transport Safety Committee, said the next morning, it's disappointing to see two recent, recent major incidents, there was one in France and one in Spain, where there's been a significant loss of life. It would seem that both are the result of human error and not the technology involved. Right? This is exactly what happens in hospitals. Patient dies, human error. Uh, have a look at that picture. What I see is a train that's come off the tracks. This is death caused by failure of technology. And naturally, we know a bit more about this. You might say, well, the driver was speeding. The track has got speed limiters on it, but the Spanish railway system decided not to put speed limiters on this length of track because it would save money. That's a failure of the technology. It's also true that the driver was on his mobile phone at the time, so he wasn't paying attention. So he didn't see he was speeding, which is all the system one, system two stuff. He was on his phone. His manager had rang him up. You know. <laughs> the company he was in caused the accident by distracting him and by not putting in safety mechanisms in the technology. And the result was the technology failed, right? It came off the track. And yet uh, a leader in Britain says, you can see this is human error. Well, the human error is in the system that driver operated him, and he is a scapegoat. Right? So th this is just an image, because I can't show you, if I showed you a dead patient and a living patient, they look much the same, and you wouldn't learn much. But accidents like this are horrific, 
and this is why trains and cars and airplanes are getting safer. In healthcare, you have to infer what's going on and you have to infer how to improve it. So I'll leave you with that to help remember. And uh, seeing as this is Dartmouth, this is a, a good quote to finish with. Do you recognize that? There's Dr. Seuss. So thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, this, is, this is the message to take home. The best way to improve healthcare is to improve the computers underneath it. You've asked lots of questions, Sergio. Can we have somebody who hasn't asked a question? Who could that be? So, <laughs> yeah. So with the calculator example, I was wondering how you were saying two, if you enter two decimals then you backspace, you'd expect the other decimal to go yeah. away, right? So what about people people at the other end of the spectrum? So if you remove that error, sorry, if, if, you, if you incorporated that when you enter a double decimal and you backspace, you delete the decimal. What about the people who are expecting a number to be deleted? Would errors start showing up at the other end of the spectrum? Because you should, well. That's how I've used the calculator all my life. I, I, I expect the decimal, not, the decimal to go over one and press back. Well, one reason why you think that is because the calculator will show you a decimal point even if you haven't pressed one. Mm -hmm. um, we've done the experiments, and if you train people, Casio make a calculator which doesn't show you a decimal point unless you press one, and it will show you two decimal points if you press two. And on those calculators, you will do better. And almost every system you use, Microsoft Word and da da da, da the, decimal, uh, the decimal points and the delete keys work correctly. Mostly because you're typing strings and you just delete the last character of the string. And what goes wrong in the calculator is the history of them is it's too complicated to keep a string. So we'll display the number and we'll do some imperative programming in the middle and try and get it right. And then somebody says, well, let's add a delete key. And of course, by the time they do that, they don't even know what the characters are you've pressed because they're presenting the number and not the sequence of characters. So the whole thing is a mess. But it's a good question. Yeah. Um, when, when I was working with the databases, I know that one of the things I always did was I would say to myself, I expect the number to be within such and such. And mm -hmm. what you're, uh, the examples you used are nice and clear, and I think you're telling us that if the numbers, if it's a complex calculation, there's no way of doing that kind of sort of combination Simpson spot thing, mm -hmm. I guess. Is it, what place is there for kind of kicking the brain in first or I mean I can understand that it's really great to have like with the gentleman before saying his comment you could say something like are you sure you wanted to delete that a message mm -hmm. coming up if it's a decimal mm -hmm. point or something like that but I think there's a role for some way of having if you can kind of define that that boundary or comment on that yeah yeah on that. there are Infusion pumps, some of them have what are called dose error reduction systems. So they have a drug library, and they know, for instance, fluorouracil is a chemo drug. And if, you ha if anybody has more than 50 milligrams of fluorouracil, you're stuffed. So it'll let you have any dose between 0 and 40. I'm making this up at this point. And that's a dose error reduction system. It turns out the dose error reduction system is so complicated to use. Everybody sets it up to say saline, and you can have as much or as little as you like of it. And then you can have two nurses both doing the calculation. So this is pairing nurses, and if they disagree, they do it again. And then the problem is if they both make the same mistake, they'll get the same wrong answer, and then you've got problems. Uh, the experiments we've done... Uh, Denise Mullinson was killed with an overdose of fluorouracil because the two nurses who did the buddy calculation, both of them somehow omitted to divide by 24, 24 hours in a day. So they gave Denise Mullinson a dose 24 times too high. 24 too times, times too high of a chemo drug is, is a really bad idea. You end up with multi-organ failure and Denise Mullinson died. The calculations they did on a calculator, if you make a syntax error on a typical calculator, 
it says, well, oh, carry on, I'll give you 63. So if I don't, because of course the, the analysis of her death doesn't say which calculator they used and what sequence of keystrokes, but how did they miss out dividing by 24? If they made, missed out a division sign, that's a syntax error the calculator should have reported. You show me a calculator that reports syntax errors. So, yeah, these the, are preventable ones, right? yeah the, the, you can't detect all errors, but we can detect a lot of them. And a lot of it at the moment is the, the devices are not find, type in a number with two decimal points. That happens one in a hundred numbers you enter roughly, and no device worries. So you could reduce the number of errors a lot by the technology being part of the team to spot some of the errors. Uh, another thing you could do, uh, so let's take the Denise Mullinson case. She was a patient who's got a, an infusion pump. She goes back to uh, Alberta Cancer Care Ward to say, now I've run out of fluids, so can I have some more? And they reprogram it and put in a new bag and send her home. And a bit later, it's all gone horribly wrong. But the infusion pump knows something interesting. It knows that Denise Mullinson had been given a dose of 1.2 mils per hour, and she's still alive. And now it has been programmed with a dose of 28.8 mils, 24 times higher. And it could have said, well, a moment ago, you gave her a dose of 1.2. Why are you giving her a dose 24 times higher? Burp, burp. But instead it said, yeah, go for it. it so there is the infusion pump knows you've got a patient alive on a certain dose. You're changing the dose by a large amount. It doesn't need to know that it's fluorouracil and there's a certain range, and it doesn't need to do this complicated calculation that's counterproductive. It could learn, or infusion pumps on pediatric wards give smaller doses. So location-aware infusion pumps could say, well, if you give a huge dose to a tiny baby, this is a bad idea. Whereas on an oncology ward, you give large doses. So location awareness could reduce things. There are lots of things that technology could do to make things safer. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I appreciate the attention to industrial psych and, and the, the, gra the, the interface sort mm -hmm. of informing how you're using it. Um, and I think one piece of equipment that you haven't talked about is the interface that's for the electronic medical record and we're putting in a uh, lot of information and if you've ever talked to any clinician who's transferred the new right. EMR systems they constantly complain okay about well I, I was, I was, I was uh, the criticism here is I didn't talk about EMRs, EHRs and the answer is I was only trying to give a one hour lecture um, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the other problem is uh, <sighs> EHRs come with confidentiality agreements, and it's much harder for legal reasons to talk about them, whereas an infusion pump, I can buy it and I can take it to pieces and I can criticize it, and there is nothing to stop me doing that. But with EHRs, it's a mess. It's a bigger mess than what I talked about, uh, and it would have taken more than an hour to do it justice, I'm afraid, but Who's it's... Doing it? hmm? Who's doing it, or, or are you? <laughs> oh, well, Ross Couple, Sean, I, and a few other people are. But it, it, it's also another thing, I, you might have noticed I talked about calculators a lot. One reason is because you know what a calculator is trying to do, whereas EHRs are incredibly complicated, and your eyes would have glazed over before it got very far. So the fact that Casio are great manufacturers, market leaders, and they make rubbish, right? That should make you think about what's going on with EHRs. Because Frankly, EHRs are not made by as good as programmers as Casio have got. Yeah. So you, you made the comparison with the automotive industry, but has, has anyone looked at comparison with like the airline industry so that, you, you know, you, we fly those planes around and when, when they get close to landing, air traffic control takes over and the pilot's not really the one landing, you know, deciding where the parameters of landing the plane. And I was just wondering, has any have hospitals or health centers tried that type of model where instead yep, of yep. all these distributed calculations you're talking about with whatever calculators at hand, mm -hmm. they're simply just calling somebody in a central location and, and asking what the answer should be? Yeah, there are, there are some places doing that. Um, the electronic uh, ICU, EICU, uh, so you've got lots of beds and people running around doing things. So over every bed you've got a camera and a microphone and a loudspeaker 
and there's a control room, a bit like air traffic control, that can look around, can monitor all the vital signs of the patients. Uh, a very common, sadly it's common, well it's not, it's not a very common problem, but it's a very common story to talk about the problem. You get tunnel vision when you're dealing with somebody. So let's say you've got an airway problem, you know, you're unconscious and the doctor will start trying to intubate you and it's hard work sometimes, you know, your throat's collapsed and getting the tube in, but you're struggling to do it. You get tunnel vision and you forget that the patient's dying on you, right? The people in the room are all trying to intubate and they lose sight, situation awareness, they lose sight of the bigger picture. The person in the control room can see the vital signs of this person deteriorating. They can put, put that up on their camera and they're, you know, they're having a latte, they're relaxed, they're not under pressure and they don't get tunnel vision, right, which is the important thing. And they can switch on the microphone, uh, switch on the loudspeaker and say, it looks like you've got five seconds, four, three, do a tracheostomy, two, one. You know? So that has been shown to save about one person a week in a decent sized ICU, because you've got people outside of the environment who are relaxed and have got bigger situation awareness. and. Uh, they talk with the people there. One of the things that's different between air traffic control and pilots is the, the EICU, you have a rotation, so it's not Big Brother telling you how to do it, but next week you're going to be up there. So everybody has a good picture of everything and it's all a big team. Uh, shall we have the lady at the back? Uh, it's another computer. It's a calculator question. So all the medical apps that are made, some people may have their favorite from their senior physicians. Are they based on the underlying uh, technology, say, in what you're writing the app for, or are they writing their own? I mean, are, do you do you have you gone through those? You talked you talked about built-in um, calculators. So, um, Possibly because you're at the back. Maybe I lost a couple of words in what you said. I'm not sure what you're asking. Oh, uh, say an, uh, an app that's yeah. made uh, a calculator. Mm -hmm. um, how different? Um, what are they relying on for their? Um, I mean, it's all new could, could programming some of this, math. Could some of this be based on Cover use? Yes, Cover use. Uh -huh. uh, somebody could sit down and work out how to implement a calculator properly. Mm, I've done that and then make that freely available. I've done that, but nobody picks it up because there is no commercial pressure to have better calculators. When you don't understand your calculator, well, you know, what does the percent key does do? It's your fault. There's no pressure on Casio to improve. It's all blaming the user. Does that, is that an answer? Uh, code reuse? Yeah. Hmm? She was wondering if the base calculator error that was in the iPhone carried over to any apps that were programmed using some calculator function? Ah, um, yes and no. Uh, I, I don't know how Apple implemented the calculator, but they have an API that anybody who builds stuff on iPhones, iPads, and so on will inherit, and the bugs in those APIs will affect everything that's implemented in it. And I exploited one of those bugs when I showed you that enormous num number in Mersey Burns, that you enter a number into a window, and the window truncates what you can see, but doesn't truncate the enormous number, which are you know, 10 to the 88 or whatever it was. You can't see that. And if somebody said, let's have an API that is safety critical and is designed to be dependable, and you can only enter a number that you can see, or there's an alarm, that particular bug would not have happened. But that bug affects everything anybody implements, unless they try very hard to get around it. And I suppose, a, corollary of this is most people who program calculators think, well, it's easy. And because they think it's easy, they don't try to do it properly. It's like, you know, it's just, just read the number and multiply by this. But uh, what is the number that the user typed and uh, who's handling the delete key and everything else? Well, that's all lost in history and it's a mess. So we have two more questions. Okay, two questions. <laughs> I was wondering if you could comment on the economics and how it impacts <coughs> this research and development versus marketing. Like if you use the car example, you can take a Volvo that has all these devices to keep you safe that warns you mm -hmm. that there's somebody to your right, mm -hmm. somebody to your left. But the cheap cars still don't have any of that. So there's a disparity mm -hmm. of possibilities mm -hmm. that you can't purchase that there. Yeah. So commenting on the economics, it's very interesting how the regulatory structure, the law, 
has made medical devices very different from cars. So let's imagine I invent airbags and I go to Ford and say, I've invented airbags. Uh, obviously, this is, I'm just making this up. Ford would say, well, next year we'll sell a car where airbags are an option. If people want safer cars, they can buy airbags. And thanks to Ralph Nader, we're all aware that we'd rather have a safer car. And now, of course, it's quite hard to buy a car without an airbag. If you go to a medical device manufacturer, it's completely different because the law for medical devices is you must make the devices as safe as possible. So if I go to B. Braun or Cardinal Health and say, you could add airbags, they say, we don't want to know because we'll be told by the regulators to put airbags in all the infusion pumps that are out there. Whereas Ford, Volvo and the rest of them work in a different way. If you invent airbags, you can sell better cars next year. You don't have to recall all the cars to put airbags in them. But at the moment, the manufacturers of medical devices don't want to know about the problems because it would cost them a lot of money to fix them. And they would also, if they could improve them, then aren't you liable for all the problems the ones out there have got so they ought to fix them? So they just see a huge cost. Whereas in the car industry, they see an opportunity to make more money out of people who want safer cars. That's a fundamental difference. And it needs fixing by Congress. Yeah. All of those that you showed us. Mm. Um, are there devices with voice recognition input? And if so, are they considered safer? Uh, voice recognition, uh, I'm afraid, is a, a Homer thing. You think it would solve all known problems because you could just talk to it. Uh, and it, there's ambient noise, there's confusion, uh, it, it ends up being worse. But we have, we have also tried knobs and sliders and pointing and things like that. And the simple rule is the fewer the buttons you have that will enter a number, the safer it becomes. But equally, which is obvious from sort of first year computer science, the fewer the buttons you've got, the longer it will take you to enter the same number. Because if, if you're in Arabic, you know, it's only log 10 operations, it'll be faster. And then people say, well, isn't it harder to use if it takes longer? Well, it's interesting. The experiments we've done is, yes, it does take longer. But when you kill somebody, you lose, you know, uh, I'm in an expert witness case at the moment, where nurses have been suspended from work for over two years over straightforward incidents. The fact that up-down keys take longer than a numeric keypad, you're never going to lose two years of your life using an up-down keypad. But you may save lives and not end up in court. So this notion of usability and speed is completely screwed. What you want is safety. That's the most important thing. And that will save the most time in the long run. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Mm -hmm.